Good morning and blessed Advent. Today is Thursday, December 21st, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Well, can you believe it? There are just three days until Christmas Eve. And in our countdown to Christmas today, we're taking a look at the hymn 382 in your Lutheran service books, We Praise You, Jesus, at Your Birth. Now, this isn't typically a Christmas song you'd hear carolers carolers sing, sorry, but I'm sure you'll hear it this Christmas season in your congregation. Written mostly by Martin Luther and translated into English by Gregory Wismar and F. Samuel Janzow, this is a hymn that is speaking of the Incarnation in such a beautiful way. But before we begin, I want to mention our sponsor, the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. They bring the true message of Christmas around the world through their translating and publishing work. So you can learn more about what they do on their website at lhfmissions.org. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode or anything in the series, feel free to reach out to me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook and send me a message there. This morning, I'm pleased to welcome back to the program the Reverend Dr. Jason Wagner. He's the pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in High Ridge, Missouri. Good morning, Pastor Wagner. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Good morning, Phil. It's great to be with you. I'm looking forward to this, doing something a little different. Yeah, it is. And it's been wonderful so far. And here we are in the, uh, what is this? This will be the penultimate episode before the end, next to last. Uh, Before we get into any of the the text or the hymn, how has your Advent and Christmas going? And, you know, what do you look forward to the most during Advent and Christmas? Well, as far as how it's been going at, at this point, we've uh, we've had our children's Christmas program, which is always one of the highlights. I mean, it's a lot of work uh, for everybody who helps to organize that, uh, but we we welcome not just our Sunday school kids as part of that program, but also our early childhood center kids take part in that, and so we have a great opportunity to connect with some of those families. Uh, we just had uh, for our last uh, midweek service. Uh, we do a service of lessons and carols, uh, and so we go back and forth through a number of scriptural passages. We'll sing a number of Advent hymns and also use some special music from uh, different members of the congregation. So uh, those are some exciting things that help us in the last uh, handful of days uh, before we get to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Uh, but for myself, when you're asking about kind of highlights up, uh, you know, all of the busyness and excitement that goes into some of these uh, extra programs. I, I always enjoy that. Uh, but a- as a pastor, and I, you can probably relate to this, there's there's something about being in the sanctuary before and after everyone gets there on Christmas oh. Eve mm-hmm. and on Christmas Day, uh, how there's a different character to the worship. Um, and, and uh, I was thinking about that some because this is the the hymn we're going to talk about is the hymn that's uh, the hymn of the day for Christmas Day. And uh, with Christmas Eve, you have all this excitement and anticipation and usually much bigger crowds. And then uh, for our Christmas Day worship, it's a little smaller group. Um, there's There's more a sense of the peace and, and the joy. Uh, that we're communicating in the scriptures and in uh, the readings uh, that's certainly there. And so, uh, like I said, I mean, there's there's something that's wonderful about all the visitors and the church families and extended family who come in town. But I think for me to actually be able to take a minute to breathe and reflect and, and think about the wonder of Christ's incarnation— uh, Christmas Day, and then the time just after those worship services really uh, provides uh, a moment to be able to do that. Oh, I agree with that. And well, 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 you know, we talk about special music, and of course, we're talking about Advent and Christmas hymns. Uh, do you have a favorite have like a Christmas favorite, hymn like or Christmas carol? Hymn or carol? Oh, uh, it's like it's like picking a favorite child, isn't it? I mean, it's a <laughs> Um, 
I, I would say probably my favorite carol uh, at this point is uh, of the Father's Love Begotten. Um, but over the course of my life, I would also probably put alongside that uh, joy to the world. Uh, for uh, Of the Father's Love, uh, it's the beauty and, and the mystery that's communicated there uh, in the incarnation of Christ. Uh, joy to the world, um, uh, it, it to me, it's it's more just the the effect of uh, the celebration, but also uh, I just have memories from whether it's my own childhood or when my kids were little. Uh, that was their favorite song uh, at Christmas, and so there's there's all those uh, memories uh, that kind of go along with that also. Yeah, I I, I was yeah, asking I, I folks was what, asking their what their least favorite was, but uh, no one ever likes to answer that, so <laughs> I'll skip that one on you. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we go ahead and dig into our text for this morning, and our text, of course, is a hymn, but uh, before we do any of that, would you please, please lead us in a word of prayer? Absolutely. Lord Jesus, we do praise you at your birth. Uh, for the reason that you have come is to be clothed in our flesh, to take on our sin, and to bring us salvation, that we might be clothed in your righteousness. As we consider uh, your word today and your coming for us, uh, give to us uh, the peace and joy of knowing that we are redeemed in you, our dear Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, what we've been doing, and no sense in stopping now, is be starting off with the with the history or the story behind the hymn, if there is one. Now, we know that We Praise You, Jesus at Your Birth is a hymn with actually a pretty rich history. You know, uh, you're going to tell us it's developed by Martin Luther, which I think most people know. I'm looking forward to hearing about that. But there's some... Uh, a little, uh, it's strange because strange. the first because verse the first was not verse. written by Luther, but rather adapted. It had been used in the church for a while. Um, but tell us about it. What What's the story behind this hymn? It definitely has a, a, a deep and extensive history in the church. You know, from my reading, I, I was familiar with it as a hymn of Martin Luther. Uh, I guess I should look a little bit closer at those tiny little notes at the bottom of the hymns. Uh, because it it lets you know at the bottom of the page in Lutheran Service Book that there's more to this. Uh, apparently, as I did some more reading, the first stanza uh, dates at least to the, the early Middle Ages. So uh, I think the first use of it uh, that we're aware of is somewhere around 1030. So we're talking, well, Luther's 500 years away from us. The original use of this hymn is another 500 years away from him. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, beyond that, then it was brought into German somewhere in the late 1300s. Uh, you'll see different dates, 1370, 1380. Yeah. So it had been commonly sung uh, in, in German for at least 150 years before Luther. And, and so it, it seems that the original text, which is largely the first verse. The, the original text was used as part of a typical uh, Latin sequence for Christmas. And so there were very set uh, readings, and along with them, there were set usually individual verses that went alongside for different seasons of the church year. Likewise, there was a sequence for Easter uh, and others uh, throughout the year. And so this was the verse uh, that was attached then to this sequence of readings uh, for Christmas Day. And that's part of why, I assume, why we continue to assign this as the hymn for Christmas Day, not merely because Luther used it, but he was using it because this is what was commonly uh, in practice. And so he took that, ver that one verse then, and we think anyway— most likely for Christmas Day in 1523, uh, he wrote the other six verses. So he fleshed out uh, some of the themes that are in the first verse uh, in the remaining six verses of the hymn. I will say, just as an aside, so for a little uh, cross-advertising here, uh, there's a nice little article in the December issue of the Lutheran Witness 
uh, about this hymn. But if you go online uh, to witness.lcms.org, there's a longer article that gives a little bit more flavor to uh, the history of Luther at the time. 1523 was a little quieter time after uh, some of the the higher times of 1520 and 1521 in particular. Uh, things were in a, at least a bit of a lull. So maybe that gave him an opportunity to to write a little bit more. And then this hymn appears for the first time in a printed hymnal uh, in 1524. So that's why the thought is there that it was probably written in 1523. So we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of this extended version of the hymn. I think that's a good way to put it, this extended version. You know, Luther picks up on that sentence, that refrain that the congregation responds to during the Lord's Supper in uh, on Christmas Day, and, and he expands upon it in this beautiful hymn. You know, I, I think it just really goes to show you that the inspiration for really all hymns should come from the scriptures. And what we're going to find as we go stanza by stanza, just like we've been doing with all of these hymns, we're going to find that the hymn might be a little deeper in its proclamation than it first appears. We get so comfortable with the lyrics and we kind of think they know what they mean, but really it, it has so much rich theology to teach us. And that's what we like about hymns, especially Lutherans. We like, we like hymns that teach, didactic hymns. I agree. And it's it, you're right, because there's something about this hymn where, you know, the rhyme scheme is very, it's birth and earth and boy and joy. I mean, it's the sort of thing that you would think is very simple, but the the number of scriptural themes and images that are just poured into these short little verses uh, really is extraordinary. What I found interesting was that there are two translators associated with sort of giving this hymn to us in the language that we can understand. Uh, stanzas two and four were translated by uh, Samuel Janzow. But stanzas, at least one stanzas one and six, uh, were translated by Gregory Wismar, who I served with when I was in the New England district. So, you know, th we have some pretty recent translations with us, relatively speaking. Well, and I think the benefit of that, it, partly what that's reflecting, is that anytime you're talking about a translation, uh, you're talking about moving from one language to another. But also the need for a fresh translation, at least in part, sometimes just speaks to we use language differently over time. And so sometimes, uh, you know, there's a need to update a translation. It might include words we don't use anymore. And so the benefit, you know, it kind of cuts both ways, where there can be a, a great benefit in including words that are unique or out of the ordinary, or even that we might think of as archaic. Uh, at the same time, uh, the hymn book becomes uh, kind of the, uh, you know, Luther talks about the great benefit of music in the life of the Christian. And so the hymn book plays this very central role in terms of communicating the truths of the scriptures. And so uh, the words have to strike this balance between teaching us, but at the same time, they need to be things that are accessible to us so that those words are able just to quickly come and enter our hearts as then we're able to turn them over and reflect back on the scriptures they come from. And so I think that's always the balance that modern translators are always hopefully trying to strike. They want to be faithful to the truth of scripture in what's being communicated in the hymn. And yet at the same time, they want to do it in a way that's going to be accessible to an entire congregation of people. Which makes a ton of sense. You know, and every translation is an interpretation, too. Now, I, I know we're not talking about Holy Scripture here, but still, you have to kind of interpret what the intentional uh, effect was that was desired from the hymns was, and exactly like you were saying, how to communicate that in an era that's a little different than when it was written. Well, I don't know sure. about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm ready to kind of dive into the text. We have seven stanzas to go through. Um, are you about ready? Anything else before we move on? I think we're good. Anything else we'll kind of get to as we go along. Exactly. Okay. Well, sounds good. We're going to start with the very first stanza. Now, this stanza is going to be very familiar with most uh, Christmas hymns. Uh, we're, we're going to sing it right now. 
or not sing it, actually, we'll speak it. We praise you, Jesus, at your birth. Clothed in flesh, you came to earth. The virgin bears a sinless boy, and all the angels sing for joy. So again, very familiar themes and refrains, probably drawing us to Luke 2. Tell us about this. Tell us about this. You know, there's. it's interesting because the first verse kind of broadens us into a number of different, very familiar texts. So certainly we're invited here to take our place in the song of the angels who are rejoicing at the virgin birth. Uh, and, and so in doing that, you're right, it takes us to Luke chapter two, uh, and which I think is interesting because by situating this as a hymn that's commonly sung on Christmas day, typically Christmas Eve, is the Luke 2 reading. So it's already in the back of people's minds uh, long before they, they ever get to the point of hearing it again on Christmas Eve. And then when they come in, they're still bringing the echoes of that with them. You know, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find this baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. All the angels are singing for joy, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. I, you can't get away from uh, that background, even as you're coming then, and then looking forward to the language of being clothed in flesh is tying together that Luke 2 passage that's so familiar to us, along with the gospel reading for Christmas Day of John chapter 1. And we'll hear pieces and echoes of John chapter 1 all along the way, that what gives the angels occasion to sing for joy is that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so this is what the angels are singing about. They're singing about that there's a reason for glory to God in the highest because he sees fit to bring his salvation and his peace to those on the earth. It is a beautiful image, a this beautiful incarnational, image. Uh, just just pointing to the incarnation, you know, clothed in flesh. I like the term, you know, you think of con carne, right? It's with meat. It's God with meat on him comes down to us. It really is cathartic. It makes us realize that this isn't something that's just like a little Christmas pageant or a little play or a cartoon, but this is something that genuinely happened in history from God and for our benefit. So the bird, the virgin bears a sinless boy and all the angels sing for joy. This verse, this very first stanza is already preaching so much in the way of necessary Christian doctrine to believe that Mary was a virgin when she was uh, when she conceived Jesus, to believe that Christ came and was clothed, was God clothed in human flesh. And of course, the angel singing for joy. Um, you write about John 1, and it kind of connects us to the very next verse, too, because in stanza 2, now, in the manger, we may see God's Son from eternity, the gift from God's eternal throne, here clothed in our poor flesh and bone. That incarnational image continues here, but we also see the eternity of God the Son, Jesus, the fact that he has always existed, not, not as Jesus, but not as, as God's Jesus, Son. As God's Take son. us through the second Take stanza. Second. Absolutely. I, you know, I think part of the beauty of the a good deal of the middle of this hymn is that you have series of contrasts. On the one hand, the word that hops out right away, because it's repeated, at least in various forms, eternity, eternal. So it's highlighting the divinity of God that extends far beyond our mortal lives. And yet at the same time, while we're talking about God's son from all of eternity, so we're talking about uh, that this is you know, this is confessing you know, a truth that the church has confessed since the earliest times, that uh, Jesus is not just a really unique guy. He's not just a, a prophet. He is more than that. He is, in fact, God's son from all of eternity. And he is also, along with it, the very gift from God's eternal throne. And so you have this idea of his majesty and his everlasting existence and life, and yet at the same time, 
as you're talking about a throne and power and majesty and all of this alongside of that you have that he is clothed in our poor flesh and bone uh, the difference and between the gift from this king of the universe who then he clothes himself, not in the way that you would expect a king to clothe himself, not with gold or light or power or majesty. He's not clothed as he is in the Old Testament with a pillar of fire or cloud and lightning and thunder as he is on top of Mount Sinai. No, instead, he is clothed in poor flesh and bone as one of us lying in the feeding trough of animals. Well, a couple of things that stand out, things. that language of poor flesh poor and bone. Flesh and bone. Is is not a, a Gnostic thought, but the sense that because we are in this world and, and, and have come from this world, born into our sin, Christ comes and takes on our flesh, of course, without sin. But we, we see here that he's come for us. It really makes it, you know, I, I, I see nowadays, you know, it used to be Jesus is the reason for the season. Now what's trendy is you are the reason for the season, which I, I like that focus too. But the whole idea is that Christ came for us. And the eternity of God, his nature, his eternal throne, his eternal as mentioned throne in stanza mentioned. two, that's something I think also should resonate with us. Because Christmas time is a lot like the Christian life. During our regular Christian lives, a lot of folks will come to church on Sunday, and then the rest of their lives, yeah, they don't the think one lives, more thing one about thing. Christ until they come to church on, on, on Sunday again. And that's lamentable. Of course, at least they're course, hearing, the word. they're hearing the word. But that's how a lot of Christians are about Christianity on a grander scale. You know, they come around, Christmas comes around, Easter comes around, they celebrate, perhaps they get together with family, they, they, they might even go to church. But uh, but are they living that incarnational reality forever? Because Christ is not someone who just came at one time a year, but rather is eternal and continues to be eternal. He's with us now. I, I think it's it, what you're talking about is such an important point. And, and we can, I, I think the reason why what you just said really struck me was that I think what we lose sight of is that we think, you know, this is a nice event to remember, and it's a good time to get together. And and if that's all that it is, we have lost completely the idea of why in the world Christ came to begin with. It's because we desperately need him. And we don't need him to be a once-a-year visitor. We don't need him uh, to be uh, a once-a-week visitor for an hour on Sunday morning. We need the life that Christ comes to bring for all of eternity. We need it every single moment. We need his salvation. We need him to come and take on our poor flesh and bone. And you're right. It's not highlighting here by using that language. It's not highlighting a sense of the diminishment of the physical world. It's saying that in comparison to Christ, of course, in, in comparison to the eternal God, the weakness of our flesh is so poor and yet, in him coming to take it upon himself, he is highlighting the incredible value of human life. And not only that, in using the word poor, I think naturally, and this is Luther using this language, I always think this leads us into the kind of language we have in the confession that talks about us being a poor, miserable sinner. Uh, here, it's the idea of, you know, why is my flesh and blood poor? It's because it is inhabited by sin, and yet he comes to take on the same flesh and bone that I have, and yet does it without sin in order that I might be forgiven, that I might be given life, that I might be able to be in the presence of God's eternal throne, that I have no business of being in the presence of apart from Christ. Well, and you talk about that language of poorness, and that's why I said that I don't want to make a Gnostic distinction, because it's not as though it's like, well, flesh is evil, wicked, sinful, bad, and the whole goal of salvation and life salvation is to escape it, because we see here that it's not flesh that's the problem. That's the Christ problem. takes on Christ. our poor flesh, but at the same time, as you so cleverly explained, the poorness comes from our inability to live as God wants us to live. Now, we've referenced John 1. I just want to read John 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
So, uh, you know, a, a lot of incarnational talk, a lot of uh, God's eternity talk, a lot of how we are, are, are the ones who need saving, you know, all of this packed into just two stanzas. I, I wonder if people I, I are really contemplating really these contemplate. things when they sing this hymn. I, I know that I don't always. I had, uh, in my first congregation, I, I had uh, a gentleman who, there were only four hymns in the hymnal he liked. So those are the only ones he sang. Uh, and otherwise, he just sat there. Wow. And I, I told him one time, I said, you know what? If if you don't want to sing, I, I, I'm not going to command you to do so. But I, I, I would invite you to do something else. So if you don't like singing the other songs, open a hymnal. And while everyone else is singing, focus on the words. Take the time to actually read them and contemplate them. Um, he did that sometimes, but I think the practice is something that is probably beneficial to us because you're right. Sometimes we can be so focused. And this actually, this hymn is probably a good example because it is a little bit of a unique tune. Uh, it's not one we immediately know. So to take some time, and actually think about the words. This is a good example of, like I said before, how the hymn book becomes a good prayer book for us. And, and that's obviously what this is. We praise you, Jesus, at your birth. Now in the manger we see. I mean, this is language where we're speaking to him, but this is a prayer. And it's a prayer in a right. statement of, it's a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Um, but nevertheless, it's a prayer. And so to actually take that time to stop and say, okay, what, what is it that I'm actually praying here? Maybe I want to, this is sort of like with the Lord's Prayer. This is why it's a good idea to go back and study the catechism again. Uh, maybe I want to know what I'm saying to God uh, <laughs> in the midst of this, this hymn here, just like we, we think about with the Lord's Prayer. So uh, to take that time to, to really slow down, and that might be, you know, maybe on occasion that does mean you let the rest of the congregation sing while you take a moment to think about the words. Right. On another occasion, it might be, you know what? I'm not as familiar with that hymn. Don't feel like you have to run out of church the second that the worship service ends. <laughs> crack the hymnal back open. Take a minute in, in contemplation to think about what is it that I am speaking back to God in this hymn? And I think to take those moments, it's another thing that, you know, maybe it might be during the collection of the offering. Uh, it there's there are moments whether that's before or even small moments might be after going to communion uh if you don't know where they're at when they're singing a communion hymn and you come back to your seat uh instead of frantically trying to figure out the right spot maybe read the words devotionally that that they're singing uh take a moment to really reflect on uh the truths that are expressed well i think that's good advice and because the hymns aren't there just for entertainment purposes, they're there to teach, and we see that in good Lutheran hymns like this one. Well, we're going to pick back where we left off when we return, so don't go anywhere, folks, but right now it's time for a break. So we'll see you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back, friends. I'm Pastor Phil Blue, your host, and this is Thy Strong Word. With me this morning is the Reverend Jason Wagner. He is the pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in High Ridge, Missouri. In the past two weeks, we've been counting down to Christmas by contemplating Christmas hymns according to the scriptures. And today we're meditating on We Praise You, Jesus, at Your Birth by Martin Luther. 
Before we head back into the hymn, I just want to remind you again that if you have any questions or comments, feedback, or any other reason why you might want to reach out, you can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook. Any of these methods can get your question or your comment out on the air. Well, Pastor, before the break, we just got through the first couple of stanzas of this great hymn. I'm going to go ahead and read the third stanza, and we're going to keep on going. So, heading back to my hymnal, I read, The Virgin Mary's lullaby calms the infant Lord Most High. Upon her lap content is he who keeps the earth and sky and sea. All right, beautiful, beautiful text. And we see this juxtaposition between Mary, the Blessed Virgin, the mother of Jesus, of Jesus. calming the very one very whose one. power keeps power and keeps maintains the universe. What a, what a wild image if we stop and think about it. Yeah, I mean, it is. It, I, I can imagine uh, a, a piece of artwork trying to take this up, right? Uh, where you have uh, Mary is holding the child. You have the the picture of her lullaby calming the infant. So you can almost imagine Mary holding this child in her hands. And yet at the same time, there's this sense in which the child is holding the world within his tiny hands. I mean, that's the kind of image that you have going on. It just kind of blows your mind. Like I said before, you have these series of contrasts. And here it's on the one hand, you have the Lord who holds all things together, uh, who is the one who holds together the earth and the sky and the sea. I mean, things that we have absolutely no control over. We have no control over earthquakes. We have no control over the weather. We have no control over the waves of the ocean. And yet at the same time, while we have no control over this, he holds all of these things. He keeps all of them constantly. And apart from his care, everything would fall apart in a moment. And yet he comes as an infant held in the hands of this young girl needing to be calmed by the lullaby of this young woman. I, it, it truly speaks of the extraordinary contrast that this is and this is not how we would have done things. This is not how we would have imagined for God to come and to bring his salvation. And yet, by the very fact that he comes in order to redeem his creation, he enters into the creation that he holds together. In order to come and redeem humanity, he takes on all of our humanity conceived as a single cell uh, growing into this child at every step of life along the way. He takes into himself in order to completely take his humanity up, uh, to take our humanity up into himself in order to redeem it all by his death and resurrection. I mean, it is, in this sense, it is so immense to consider how the creator becomes the creation, and in doing so, redeems that creation. You know, of course, the, something like this, when we ever we talk about the Virgin Mary, we think of uh, Isaiah, we could think of Matthew 1, 23, which is simply quoting Isaiah, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Certainly something that's being touted here. At the same time, this reminds me a little bit of the, uh, the much maligned uh, Christmas song, uh, Mary, did you know? People like to malign that because, oh, of course she knew because the angel because told, the her. Angel and told her. And I think that goes quite a bit of, uh, it's a good argument for a lot of this, this song. But at the, same time, at the same time, I think it's okay I for us okay to for contemplate us. the fact that Mary, being merely human, merely human did, not did not recognize all the, um, all the just the, the vastness and amazing, and amazing. Uh, power that her little infant child held within his little hands. And, and so, you know, Mary was not omniscient. So I think this verse kind of reminds me of that. It's a contemplation of how, while Mary is obedient and willing to do the Lord's will and, and, and is eager for the coming of the Messiah herself, herself, she still doesn't completely know what all that entails. And we get that same sense here. I agree. 
And, and, and you're right, because we could say the same thing, right, about the disciples. But Jesus told them all the time, this is what right. I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer under the chief priests and the scribes. And, and uh, then I will be killed. And on the third day, I will rise. And they look at him and say, yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah, they're uh, like, that's, that's great. That's great. Until it happens. <laughs> yeah. So it's true that in one sense, Mary is told a number of things. Mary's not told everything. Um, but she is told, she's told more than, than others. So she has a sense of what is coming. And yet at the same time, uh, we see throughout the Gospels that until Christ is risen from the dead, nobody completely gets it. Nobody gets the full picture. And then all of a sudden, in in his resurrection, as he shares the meal with the disciples that he walks with on the way to Emmaus, uh, all of a sudden, now, and he opens the scriptures to them. And you have that phrase that's used a couple different times in Luke's gospel, both there and then uh, when he talks with the disciples also. Um, yeah, it's then that as he starts to say, yeah, all of these things. This is how this fulfilled the scriptures. And while in one sense, Jesus was telling them this before, it, it does point towards that until his work of salvation is complete, again, this is not the way that we would do things. So to grasp it in full, and let's be honest, part of the reason that we continue to come back to the word is because, yes, this is where God is present with us. Yes, uh, this is where we hear the promises of God that we need to hear again. But I have never met a pastor who said, yep, I have mastered it all. I understand everything in the scriptures. I can tell you everything that's there. Uh, the depths of what God has to say to us and what he's revealed to us is more than we can possibly study in a lifetime. And, and so, yeah, th this this idea that that of course, Mary did not have the full picture. And yet at the same time, for us to be able to look back uh, and contemplate what and who and all that he's going to accomplish that she is holding in her hands is truly extraordinary. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the beginning of John's first letter, where uh, John is writing on behalf of the disciples, but in one sense, he's writing on behalf of uh, of any, uh, not just for himself, he's writing for uh, the whole band of followers, when he starts out by saying that that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, which we've touched with our hands concerning this word of life, that life was made manifest. We've seen it. We testify to it. We proclaim to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we've seen and we've heard, we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so you have these echoes of the beginning of John's gospel that talks about the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And you have, you're holding together all the, all the time that, yeah, how could you easily wrap your mind around this infant child? is the source of all things. I mean, it, and yet such is the mercy of God that not only is he the source of all things, but in order to be the source also of our salvation, he comes in so weak and small a way. It is beautiful. And that, that's the great uh, joy of, of Christmas. Well, speaking of John's gospel, you know, the next stanza really could have been taken right out of John's emphasis on uh, putting light and darkness in contrast to one another. Uh, famous in John, also famous in stanza four. The light eternal breaking through made the world to gleam anew. His beams have pierced the core of night. He makes us children of the light. So light eternal breaking into the world, we're gleaming anew. We have the, this imagery of beams of light, but also piercing darkness. John 8, 12 says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Of course, 
it's all through John, this idea of Jesus being the light in the being darkened the world. The darkened but we world. see that in stanza four. I mean, the, the image of light, it's just everywhere, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. This is the beginning of creation, that we go from darkness to light. So this is the pattern of what God does across everything. Uh, in Isaiah, we have the great passage that we usually hear on Christmas Eve, the people who walked in darkness, that that light that God created and that he intended for his creation was darkened by the reality of our sin that has cast a veil over all of humanity. And yet those people who have walked in darkness, they've seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness on them, light has shined. And you're right, that led us into John chapter 1, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world, and that is this Jesus. Because then, as Paul says, not only, not only as Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, but then also Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, he has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. So, I mean, in the text here, yeah, you're, it's very it's very close to a paraphrase of the words that you get from John chapter 1. Mm -hmm. But just like we were talking about before, that the image, I mean, the words are pretty simple, the light eternal breaking through. So, you're looking backwards, the light eternal, the one who is bringing light at the very beginning of creation is now breaking into the darkness once more. You know, he made the world not only, but he made the world to gleam anew. So again, you have this idea of creation and recreation, of a new creation. And his be beams have pierced the core of night. He makes us children of the light. Not only does he bring light to the world, he enlightens our hearts. He has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, as I read from Paul a second ago, that he even makes us children of the light. And this is why he has come. He has come in order to endure the darkness, in order to bring his light and bring his light to us by faith in him. And I'm thinking about what does it mean to be children of the light, right? He makes us children of the light, but that just isn't just – obviously it's a, it's a passive reception. We receive God's grace and his forgiveness, not by our own efforts, et cetera, et cetera. But then once we are made anew, then that should mean something for our lives, and it should mean something for the way we worship God and proclaim his message to the world. Uh, just popping in at Christmas to hear this, and this is the only time you've been there all year, um, to contemplate this uh, to stuff contemplate this must stuff. be very awkward for the Christian who struggles to make it to church. Yeah, I think it, I think it challenges us. Um, and certainly it confronts us uh, with our sin. I mean, I was thinking about, uh, as you were talking, and the scripture reference off the top of my head escapes me, but uh, we're encouraged to walk in the light as he is in the light. Um, and, and so, you know, we were talking before about how this is not a one time a year sort of thing. It's not a one time a week sort of thing. I mean, you can think about it this way. Then we're talking about these images of light and darkness that we're to walk in the light. And, and so that's to exemplify uh, the one who is the light of the world. At the same time, uh, I think that's interesting that Jesus says both that he is the light of the world and that his people are the light of the world, that we're meant to reflect that light, to live in that light, to live as uh, he has given us this new life um, in being new creations. And, and as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, you know, it would be really difficult to only have the lights on one hour every week <laughs> or to say, you know what, I'm only going to open my eyes for one hour this year when I go to church on Christmas. Uh, this is part of what it is to live in the light. It is, it is both to live in the light in the sense of we are constantly living in the light of who Christ is, living in the light of his word. I mean, you can see light is just all over the place in the scriptures. It talks about the way we are to live. It talks about how we're given new life. It talks about that's the source of life, all of these things. And so it, would not, it wouldn't make any sense to say, yeah, I think I'd rather live in darkness for every hour of every day except for that one time a year. 
And that cuts both ways. It cuts both in terms of us being made alive and sharing in the life that we have in Christ, who is our light. But also then, yeah, when we go and we walk, well, it's a whole lot easier to do that with the lights on. It's a lot harder. I mean, even in a place that you know, it's tough to navigate the house at night when all the lights are off, like especially if the power goes off. And so even the little lights that are around, and now all of a sudden you're trying to bang your way through the house to light a candle or whatever the case is, it gets a lot tougher, even in places that you know. So to live by the light is both to be enlightened by Christ and by his mercy, forgiveness, and salvation. But having been enlightened, we don't hide it <laughs> under a bushel. <laughs> We go and we shine our light. We shine the light of Christ in all that we do, in all that we say, and everywhere that we go. And so we're constantly then living uh, with the light of his word and his peace uh, that he comes to bring. Stanza 4 says, the light eternal breaking through. Well, stanza 5 tells us what that looks like. Stanza 5 says, the very Son of God sublime entered into earthly time to lead us from this world of cares to heaven's courts as blessed heirs. So we have imagery here of of the God entering into earthly time. It suggests that God lives outside of time, which is true. Uh, But it also talks to us about um, our eternal home. And, and it says heavens here. I mean, we might substitute heavens and earth to be most accurate, but so far as the hymn's concerned, this is is beautiful, right? Because God's come to give us what he give wants us, what he us wants to have as an inheritance, heaven. and that is eternal life in a eternal perfect life. world. That's what he wanted for, us from, he wanted for us from the beginning. Yeah, it, it is beautiful. You're right. But we would, if we were doing this in longer form or if it wasn't in poetry sure we would talk about the new heavens and the new earth we've been talking about the new creation kind of language that's all the way through here and yet here it's talking about this expansive idea of what we mean of heaven what is what do we mean by heaven we mean to be in the presence of god right that's the essence of heaven to be in the fullness uh, of god's presence and as you're saying this the language of being an heir of one who receives the full inheritance, the one who, the only one who deserves that sort of thing is Jesus himself. And yet, again, Paul writes Galatians chapter four, he says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons now, meaning by faith in Christ. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you are an heir through God. Everything that belongs to Christ all belongs to you. All the riches of salvation, all of his, uh, if you think about it, the incredible, uh, we're talking before about these kind of regal imagery, the throne of God, that this is what he leaves that's what he leaves that in order to then welcome you into the very throne room of God, into heaven's courts. I mean, that's the image that's going on there. And again, you have this great contrast between between leaving behind this world of cares, all of the things that would burden us, the sin that clings to us, the death that haunts us, uh, the pain that pinches in on us all the time, all of these things that wear on us and weigh down on us because of the brokenness of this world on account of our sin. He's leading us away from that. How? By entering it, by entering all of those things completely in order then that we might enter into the place that rightly belongs only to him. And that is to be the blessed heir. Uh, a prince and a princess of the everlasting king of of heaven and earth, and entirely as a gift from Christ, who has seen to it that we would be adopted as sons, those who have a full inheritance along with Jesus. Stanza six, some more of that beautiful juxtaposition and imagery comes in. It goes, in poverty, he came to earth, showing mercy by his birth, He makes us rich in heavenly ways as we, like angels, sing his praise. praise. 
I think of Second Corinthians 8, you know, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Second uh, Corinthians 8, 9. So we have this imagery of Christ's sacrifice, not just starting at the cross, but starting at his, uh, his uh, infinite decision to descend and take on human flesh. So the suffering of Christ, especially as considered by the early church, begins really at his conception and birth, not just suffering on the cross or even suffering uh, by you know being put on trial and beaten, but the suffering through life is partly what Christ did to uh, earn us our salvation. Yeah, so I mean, going back to you know, confirmation class, we talk about uh, the humiliation of Christ. Uh, and that doesn't mean his embarrassment, of course. It means uh, the ever entering in humility for the sake of humanity. And so he is constantly emptying himself in one thing after another, going from the eternal power and glory of heaven and entering into the womb of Mary and going further into suffering uh, and humiliation in entering into his ministry, entering into the waters of baptism uh, in the Jordan River. Why? Not because he needs to be baptized, but because we need uh, him to be baptized. We need to be joined to him. And so he joins himself uh, to us. And then going further, he has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, he goes from town to town. Uh, he suffers under Pontius Pilate. I mean, again, you can just walk through every single piece of his life. And as he takes uh, on all of our poverty, he is emptying himself of his glory in order to give us uh, those riches and the forgiveness and salvation uh, that he has come to provide. Um, and I think this is where there there is no... But we kind of, it's good for us to highlight these moments, to highlight the moment of Christ's incarnation, although we would do that earlier, uh, back in March. Uh, we would we would celebrate his incarnation. It's probably the right, I guess that's the right way we should speak, to celebrate his incarnation in his birth, that he has taken on our flesh. Uh, but it's good for us to celebrate uh, his uh, epiphany. It's good for us to celebrate his ascension. It's good to celebrate. It's all of these things are good for us to remember because, uh, in one sense, uh, it's all it is all one story. I think it's easy for us to kind of chop things up and say, well, there's the Christmas thing, and we do that. We see little baby Jesus, and he's really cute, and that's nice. And then we do the thing later on where he dies on the cross, and we almost act like this is two different people in one sense, um, but. His life is all absolutely interconnected. It is this one constant process of him emptying himself, of becoming poorer and poorer in order to give all that he might then give that to us in giving us all of the riches of life and salvation. I, I, I think so this is where we can never completely separate these things out. That's why it's good like for us to recite the creed at Christmas. And we don't just stop at, he was born of the Virgin Mary. Amen. Right. <laughs> we go ahead and we rehearse the whole thing because this is why he's come. He's come in order to then continue his humiliation for the sake of humanity. Something, I mean, just it's something deep and and something for us to consider all that Christ has done because as you said, you know, I've had people who accuse uh, Lutherans and Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox even uh, of uh, – these are pr uh, usually evangelicals. They don't like the idea of Jesus hanging on the cross, and yet they have no problem with no putting problem a little with, baby like Jesus little in the manger at Christmas. And they'll tell you, well, well, Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. Cross anymore. Um, and we could reply, well, Jesus isn't in the manger anymore. <laughs> but why do we look to these symbols, these images? Because Christ didn't just be born. He didn't just die. And he didn't just rise again. But he did all of these things, including living that perfect life that we could never live. This is the cross event. This is what Christ has done for our salvation. 
which is why to just show up at, say, Christmas or Advent, it kind of, well, you're shortchanging yourself the story of God's, uh, you know, inbreaking, that light breaking into the darkness like we talked about earlier. Yeah. And that in taking on the totality of our humanity, he comes for your entire life. He comes to redeem you completely. Uh, he comes uh, to, uh, th and I think that's that's really the essence of what we're talking about there, that in seeing the fullness that every single thing that Christ did was necessary for our salvation, because our salvation was not merely just, oh, he canceled the debt. That's true. He did do that. He also assumed our humanity. He also... Um, he also, what are all the other images that we have in the scriptures? They're of course escaping me right now because uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking about something else and then I, I started going to this, but you have all of these different ways. He is the light in the darkness of our world. He is the bread of life while we are hungering and thirsting, uh, for hope and peace and forgiveness. Uh, again, you can just keep going. This is why there's just one image after another. And it's not that they're mutually exclusive from one another. It's that Christ comes to do all of it. Right. right. Because this is what we need. We need salvation for all of our lives. In the same way that when we preach, we can preach the gospel as Christ being victorious over the world, sin, death, and Satan, or we could preach him as being vicarious by, you know, taking our punishment upon himself. Uh, we can teach of uh, all the different kinds of ways in which Christ uh, fulfills prophecy and and brings us our salvation. It, it really is rich, and it's more than just one image. And that brings us really to the last stanza, which says, All this for us our God has done, granting love through his own Son. Therefore all Christendom rejoice and sing his praise with endless voice. After all, the hymn is called, We Praise You, Jesus, at Your Birth. And just like Romans 5, 8 tells us, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we see this. Christ has done all of this out of his love for us. You know, this is the same God of the universe who sought to destroy the universe in the flood, but preserved, of course, Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives. But he did that in view of this day, too. Christ is always, or I should say God in general, you know, God is always sort of holding up his end of the bargain, the covenant, and also our end too. What a gracious God we have. Amen. And this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins. And I, I think that's really where Luther leaves us, that this is the reason to rejoice. That all of these things he's done, giving to us his love through his son, that's our reason for rejoicing. This is why we rejoice at Christmas, because we rejoice in all that God has accomplished for us in Jesus. Amen to that. Well, anything else as we finish up this hymn and send people on their way on our next to last episode in our series of Counting Down to Christmas? The last thing I'll say actually is a kind of a minor note that I had way at the beginning that like I looked over every single verse ends uh with the statement alleluia praise the lord now originally the hymn ended uh with a different form of kyrie of saying lord have mercy I, I think especially in the way that luther points us now there's something appropriate about either one of those lord have mercy uh the kyrie liaison is this statement of as the king comes near, we look for his mercy and peace. And so that's why we use it uh, in our worship service in various places. But at the same time, I think the right place actually is the move to saying, praise the Lord. If there is a reason for us to give praise and thanks, if there is a reason for us to rejoice, and certainly Christmas is, you know, the second highest of the great high and holy days in the church here, if there's a reason for us to praise the Lord. It is that Jesus has come in mercy, to take on the totality of our humanity, to live, to die, to rise, to take all of it into himself in order to give us his salvation. That is a reason for us to join in endless praise. 
Amen to that. We do praise you, Jesus, at your birth, and we also praise and thank you for great pastors like my guest this morning, the Reverend Dr. Jason Wagner. He's the pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in High Ridge, Missouri. Brother, thanks so much for being on the show again. My pleasure. Have a blessed Christmas. You too. Hey, tomorrow, folks, our countdown comes to a close as we reflect on, well, at least the very last hymn I like to include on our lessons and carols that I have at our church on Christmas Eve, and that is Joy to the World, because it's also the very first hymn I sing or have the congregation sing on Christmas Day. It connects the two services, Joy to the World. That's what we're going to reflect on tomorrow as we come even closer to the end of this year and the end of Advent and the Christmas season. So until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.